Let's begin. Um, first thing I have to say, uh, I have a long list of things I have to say today. <laughs> Jennifer has been <laughs> giving me a confidential list of things. Uh, it's okay? Now, this is uh, the inaugural lecture of, of, of this kind of uh, alumni insights series that is uh, begun by uh, Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee. And it's, it's a kind of new thing that will bring, I'm sure, a lot of, of interest to, to, to this lecture series that we are dealing with in Piper. Um, it's also an opportunity to, for all of us, and for the students, to see um, how the diverse careers are organized by ex-students in this school. And uh, uh, I'm really happy to be the one that to introduce him, um, um, Johnston Markley, uh, uh, like the lecturers tonight. I mean, this is a film that was um, open in 1998. I, ha I have so many papers that I... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that is based, as you, all of you know, in Los Angeles, and that in this moment is dealing with interesting projects in, in, in different countries and continents, and I, I, can, I can say a, a couple of them, like the Menil Drawing Institute in Houston, Texas, or the USLA Graduate Art Program in Culver City in California, and some others in a winery in Montepulciano, that is a wonderful place. <laughs> in Italy, or uh, the Pavilion of Six Views in, in Shanghai, in China, in China, or, or, or others, other houses and, and other um, buildings in, in Chile and in, in Penco, in Chile, and another one. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the the film has um, had uh, many notable awards. Uh, including the Progressive Architecture Design Award, the AIA Los Angeles and uh, AIA California Council of Honor Awards, the American Architecture Award and, and Architectural Record Award uh, uh, for Emerging Architecture. And, uh, they received uh, in October in, in 2013 the, the President Award for Emerging Practice by the American Institute of Architects uh, Los Angeles Chapter. And they are now preparing, and uh, it's forthcoming, no? a monograph, um, uh, a 2G monograph, uh, which is a very interesting collection of names. And also they are preparing a book, which is House is a House is a House is a House is a House, etc. <laughs> which is uh, a reflection on, on the work's film, in, uh, the film's work in, from, from, from the beginning. And uh, said all the, I mean, I can, I can, say many other things about their background, the teaching and studying in different universities, but I, I prefer to, to just to make a brief comment on, 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 on the interest of, of, of their work and practice, um, according to my point of view. <laughs> no, and I think that one of the most interesting things is that the work of um, an international expansion of, of this young office uh, that has now like 15, 15 years, uh, uh, is remarkable. Uh, I mean, it's, it's remarkable both in quantitative and qualitative terms. No? But but more importantly, it's remarkable for, for due to its consistency, you know, a kind of consistency acquired step by step, project by, by project, as if they were driven by a kind of hidden forces, never too explicit making them work stubbornly connected or suspended of, of the thin line that divides and connects complexity and simplicity, which is for me the key point of, of, of their work. This is normally a thin line uh, that they have made thick enough as to contain all their work, questioning many assumptions or many conventions that have been uh, adopted to describe their work. No, I mean, I've read um, these days some stuff on 
the links of your work uh, to the so-called LA school, which is one of the most boring things that one can read, in my opinion. I mean, there are, there's always a Madrid school, a Barcelona school, a Milano school, and I think that this is the typical invention of bad critics, and I, I don't want to enter into this, but there are other things like the, this is, makes more sense for me, the, the influence of the historical interest of the GSD, uh, in geometry and form, and I think that this, this is something that you will perceive very clearly. Also, the impact of uh, their European experience, I think they, they have a kind of touch of Swiss architecture, not, not entirely, but, but you can, it smells like Swiss in some moments. <laughs> all, all these ingredients are there, but I, I don't think they, they, uh, they are critical in, in, in understanding the, the, their world. It's part of the ingredients, but they, they are like the salt and pepper. It's not the, the most important thing. I, I, I think that uh, uh, instead of this, uh, what is interesting is, is that uh, the, the consistency they have f and how it is founded in, in like two main, maybe complementary uh, factors that, is, that explain in a way the ambivalent relationship they maintain with, with this, um, blur, this idea of blurring the limits of, among what, uh, what a complex architecture is about or what, what a simple architecture is about. I mean, there's, a, there's always a kind of division, you know, someone that is dealing, trying to really um, approach architecture, trying to s synthesize and to simplify the problem and those others that are always trying to, and, and they, they maintain this kind of point that is very difficult to distinguish <laughs> or to understand w in which position they are. I think that the first factor that can describe this uh, uh, is th this, this ambiguity is the focus on um, paradoxical games with the ordinary in relationship with the constraints they have to face in uh, every specific commission. Uh, they uh, many times they intensify the most banal consequences of the constraints and limitations imposed, um, allowing them to achieve unexpected and unpredictable, in a way, um, uh, results. Mm -hmm. uh, prototypical structures as, as the box or the pitch roof or, or, or many uh, or just the repetition of windows uh, uh, become subject of some kind of contortions and almost mm, anthropomorphic deformation, deformations driven by these constraints and, and giving way to, to uh, in, uh, unpredictable results. And I think that, that this is very paradoxical. They are co completely conventional. At the same time, they are completely in disrupting the, the way you interpret these, these, these forms. Other, other, thi other thing that I, I think that is quite interesting is the intensification of one single aspect of the project, just one. Probably as a consequence of, of, of the economic limitations, as, as everyone has to face, no? but it's a tactic or a technique that, that explores just one texture or one window or one material uh, repeated or exaggerated uh, to create rhythm, focus, and differentiation. And um, this technique, I think, that comes from their closeness to the art scene, and, and in many times, in many times, I can I can see the influence of some paintings, painters, and some some kind of uh, plastic activities. Um, well, <clears throat> the, and the other, I mean, the other take that I want to mention is the the second characteristic that I want to mention is is. Uh, the need of having fun. I mean, uh, are you, uh, they transmit a sensation that they are having ha fun, real fun, while designing that is very unique, I would say, and, and very important. Fun is not, is not an easy e e thing to talk about. I mean, in one way, is the most complex thing and the most simple response of human beings to different um, stimuli. So, so it's, again, fun is something that is in between something very complicated and very simple. But in contrast with so many, many serious faces that the architectural and especially the academic life, not in this school, uh, uh, is, uh, creates, uh, 
their work is naturally empathic. I mean, the, the empathy that it creates, it, it breathes immediacy, you know, so, and, and it, it's like, it's constantly um, saying you that uh, uh, this profession is not so complicated as, it's, as it looks, uh, or in more precisely that their art or their architecture is about uh, surprising you, making easy and fun what the things that uh, many of us consider technically uh, a nightmare. And a, an accumulation of problems and contradictions. You know? and their business is just the opposite. It's about, mm, it's like the rabbit in the hat. No? Yes, it's the voila. It is the, the, some kind of simplicity appears and makes sense for, for all these problems. And I think that it, it reminds me, uh, my dear Alejandro de la Sota, my master when I was young, that saying that me constantly that architecture is just fun. <coughs> if you are not enjoying and laughing while designing, you are in serious trouble. It was literally what he said. I mean, in serious risk of falling in other business, uh, a business that he called uh, Archicracia, a kind of neologism of uh, architecture and, and bureaucracy. And, and, and I think that this is a kind of a very important issue in this in, in nowadays and in, in the architecture of, of, of Johnston and Markley. So I'm sure that tonight we will enjoy one complete section of 100% uh, pure architecture, 0% of Archicracia with them. So please join me in welcoming Sharon and Mark. Thank you, Inaki, for the uh, really thoughtful um, introduction. Um, I, I think we, we, we do confess we have a, maybe a, we aspire to have a Swiss mind, but a, a Mediterranean stomach. So, <laughs> so we always laugh with our stomach, but uh, cry inside our brain. Uh, uh, and uh, earlier, we were at this uh, alumni council reception, and we share with the group that we are uh, honored to be selected to be the first inaugural lectures for this uh, alumni reflection series, uh, barely edging out uh, I.M. Pei, Frank Gehry, and Fumie Komaki <laughs> for this uh, first series. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, kidding aside, you know, this is an important lineage that uh, we feel we are part of that tradition that we think you will be too. So uh, weight aside, I think there's, this is a really momentous force uh, regarding this, this lecture series and being an alumni here. Um, uh, also, the, the title, the alumni reflections. I, I think for us, giving a talk is both an opportunity to share some of our efforts uh, of the last 15 years, but also it's a moment of self-reflection, looking back at our projects. Uh, oftentimes, we work on very specific situations, and we barely have time to step back and look back at a larger picture. Uh, as Inaki mentioned, we have uh, had a practice for 15 years, and, and like many uh, uh, architects based in Los Angeles, we have relatively modest scale projects, like in the lineage of Schindler or Neutra, a lot of single family houses. Um, uh, as we look back at this group of work, uh, we try to find commonalities. Um, I like to, we like to start the talk by an image by an LA-based painter, Kim Dingo. Uh, the title of this painting is uh, United Shapes of America. And uh, it is a composite drawing of US maps drawn from memory by teenagers from Las Vegas. So I, I think if you, uh, you don't have to be an expert to know that some of these teenagers are dealing with some issues or um, <laughs> most of them should not be uh, studying architecture, like. except for this one. Yeah. Yeah. This one might get a scholarship from Princeton. But uh, 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 I, I think the, the, yeah. I think the, the obvious thing is like all these differences, you know, all the, the gigantic Florida and the, the Great Lakes, you know, all these discrepancies. Uh, uh, while we appreciate all these differences, we also ask ourselves like, uh, what, is, what, what is it that holds everything together? In this case, in this piece, it's really the, the shared mnemonic shape of the US maps. And because we all know the shape of the US maps, all these differences can occur. And, and sometimes we ask ourselves, uh, do we have something equivalent in our discipline? Do we still have a shared project? You know, is there an equivalent of this shared shape that allow all these differences to occur? And is, if, if so, is it type? Is it, 
Is it, is it syntax what it is? And I think this is something we don't have an answer for, but we always ask. And also, on another level, this serves as a self-reflection for ourselves. What are our commonalities that tie some of our projects together? So we, we'd like to start by showing the very first project we did when we started our office 15 years ago, a project that only lasted for two weeks. And we've forgotten about this project. But recently, we read uh, about Francois Truffaut saying that uh, you, can, you can deduce the entire career of a filmmaker by looking at his first 150 feet of film. So we dug up this project, and, and uh, in, in more than one ways, there are certain things that, we, that mattered to us back then and still matter to us now. It's a small pavilion in Michigan. On one side, it faces a, a river, which has a very horizontal view. On the back side, it faces a valley with a very, very vertical view. So we, we basically took the same picture window, place it horizontally on one side, place it vertically on the other, combine it, and then that forms the, the, this single room building. Uh, the uh, plan and elevation, we basically use one curvature. One curvature that, that changes from being concave, concave to convex that forms the edge. So we, we didn't really de develop this building, but I think in many ways it, it sets a certain tone for us of uh, multiplying elements, sim similar em elements in different ways, and also maybe a, a predilection for edges and profile over um, uh, the algorithm of surfaces. Um, I think in many ways it relates to the issue of apertures and how apertures are not only an interface uh, of, of view, but also an interface of uh, light and atmosphere between interior and exterior. These are images from the famous uh, Corbusier sketches, the battle between him and Perre, the horizontal window, the, the, the light that could be transmitted into a room versus a, a vertical window, Corbusier's sampling of windows from, from Roman to Gothic to uh, Louis XIV. And this whole episodic uh, 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 description of the, the distant view of, of Rio, the, the, uh, the, the middle view, and then the desire to sit in front, and then the picture window. So, so I think this is something that always we look at artists' work, in this case, Olafur Eliasson or Jan de Bits, the, the tension of the framework. It's not just an innocent picture window that frames the view, but how the horizon line can be spatialized in the immediate foreground. So not yeah. only in the frame, but also in the way that um, the, the horizon line, the, the, the shape of the frame can come, come together and start to inform atmosphere, but also formal development of the, of the architecture. This, uh, this project, this is in the town of Rosario, yeah, about three hours northeast of uh, Buenos Aires. And it's situated at a development, it's a relatively new development. Uh, when we started the project, there was nothing around it. But we know that in the future, two of the four sites will have buildings, although it sits at the edge of a development. So we planned the house by thinking about how the view could be disclosed, or as you walk around the house within a spiral circulation. So every time you walk around, every time you turn within the spiral circulation, you see the view very differently until you get to the rooftop when you have this panoramic view of the Pampas again. So uh, this is the first project we did outside of, uh, outside of the US. So we were very cognizant of how we can create this object uh, by having very, very simple uh, 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 geometric uh, mandates. Basically, the primitive is a marriage between an ellipse and a, and a rectangle. And, and we made uh, four cuts. Uh, uh, two cuts are straight cuts on curved surfaces, singularly curved surfaces, and then two cuts are fragments of a sphere. I think our logic is that if they could build the formwork for a, a, a dome, it would be easy for them to build a formwork for a, a fragment of a dome. So, so at the end, uh, the house is an object that has a, a, the, 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 the cutting of the volume itself is closely related to the placement of the windows, both in the interior uh, and the exterior. Uh, here on the upper right, you see part of this spherical cut, and on the lower left is part of this straight, uh, flat cut that's slightly tilted on a singularly curved surface. Um, the, the curvature itself, uh, uh, interior-wise, is a means of bringing a secondary source of natural light into the space. Um, and then you, you walk up into this outdoor room before ascending up to the rooftop. Uh, this house was like started after us and then finished way before <laughs> us. Um, uh, in, in the contrast, the interior is actually much more open and lighter. 
with a, with a double height space. Um, we, we thought when we're designing the project, we thought a lot about episodically, the relationship between the windows and the, the cuts. So they always have this uh, checkerboard relationship. And uh, so you can see the openings next to a cut, and then next to the opening, and next to a cut again. So we, we thought the, uh, the, 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 the view, the landscape is unveiled to you more like a strip tease, one piece at a time, before you reach the climax of, of the roof. And then this is, uh, this is the, when you ex exit, and then you walk into this semi-outdoor room that's partially enclosed before you walk up into this, this deck itself. And then you see the surrounding pampas again. When, uh, when, when this house was published in some uh, website, the, the, the best uh, comment that we received was from a blogger who said, this house looks like the love child of Mario Bota and a septic tank. So <laughs> we're not sure if that was a compliment, but we do kind of like this. Maybe that was really the the best formula. You know. But I, I think for us, it's, uh, uh, aperture itself is not uh, innocent. You know, sometimes it's coplanar with the surface. Sometimes it's set back uh, where it pro uh, the volume itself provides shade. Uh, sometimes it, it declares itself as a presence. Almost the analogy for us is blowing a soap bubble into a container. It's not always uh, a subservient by the container, but sometimes it, it declares its own existence. This is a, a, a small pavilion in, in uh, Chile, in the Bio Bio region, near the town of Concepcion that suffered a devastating earthquake a few years ago. And uh, the, the project is a, uh, uh, interesting about this project, it, it actually came from the Earthquake Reconstruction Fund, which a majority of which went into uh, infrastructure and housing. Um, but they managed to, a small group managed to take a small, a small amount of that money to commission uh, 10 pavilions, uh, 10 pavilions that would serve their immediate neighborhood during the period of, of reconstruction so they could use it as a school room, they could use it as a meeting room for the city hall. And then when reconstruction was finished in five years, they would use for a cultural program for exhibition. So there would be exhibitions that would travel from one pavilion to another. 10 architects were invited, everyone was given this really beautiful site. Ours was sitting on this bluff overlooking the bay uh, in the middle of a pine forest, a very small project at uh, 250 square meters. Um, so for us, it's, it's uh, one hand, there's this very small building, but a very massive site. So how, how do you capture the, uh, the energy of the site? Uh, another is that uh, no matter what this building is used for, we think the auspices of the project has to do with a sense of memorial and a loss. So we, we feel there's some contemplative dimension to it. So the first thing we did was we, we, we did this volume that's 250 square meters, and we, we tried to double the volume just as an outdoor room, just direct uh, replication. So at the end, um, you have two volumes that are the same. You enter into a courtyard that opens to the sky, and then you enter into another room with the exact shape that opens up to the view. So in, the, in a way, the courtyard becomes a room that purges your experience before you enter and blocks the view before you enter into the room again. So uh, this is the courtyard. You enter into the courtyard and uh, we take out the roof and we place all the um, ancillary functions, the bathrooms and storage areas on the side. Uh, it's really the dynamics is in the plan and everything is it's just extruded. It's a very simple uh, um, one-story pavilion. Um, and, and we're even planning to, to leave the ground as it is, as is. So the only thing that really defines the space is, is this wall. Um, and we, we also plan to uh, uh, clad the wall. Uh, it's, we built, built out of concrete, but we wanted to use the, 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 uh, the tree trunks uh, of the, uh, the oak trees that you walk through past as the formwork. So in a way, you walk through the forest and you have this rhythm of these tree trunks. And then you use the same rhythm again to create this uh, bit brutalist and rough uh, uh, edged uh, uh, courtyard. And then in, in contrast, you walk into the room, the next room will be really mirrored polished concrete. So um, for us, it's the shape of the room, this half ellipse also suggests this half panorama. 
so on one hand, you, we work, work against the curvature of the bay, but also the importance of us, the reflection of the horizon line, even vaguely into the room. So you're on one hand captivated by the view, but always conscious that there's this surrounding uh, horizon line. Um, this is a house in Oxnard, which is between LA and Santa Barbara, it's situated right on the, the beach. And like many beachfront properties, um, uh, the lots are very narrow and very long. And uh, they're really packed like sardines. Uh, and most people would put their living room here and the master bedroom above, <coughs> which are great for those rooms, but the entire house feels very dark. And uh, oftentimes you also have to enter quite uh, unceremoniously you know, between these type of tight alleys. So what we did in the outset was to really open a big courtyard in the middle, at the darkest part of the house, to have an entry courtyard. Uh, the second thing we wanted to do is to see, find a way to bring the view as, as, as deep into the house as possible. So um, uh, as a diagram, we, we gave each room a shape, uh, in this case a barrel vault, and packed them in, into a box. So in a way, it's a, a part of a, a variation of a shotgun typology. They're all vaults. There's a certain directionality, and they're all pointed towards the, the beach. And they're all open on the ends. So um, these are earlier sections. So if you cut a series of sections, all rooms are, are really defined, but they're connected at the same time. And not, not through a sense of axiality, but in the general directionality. So even when you're two thirds or, or Three, uh, in, in deep into the house, you still sense the, the view and you still sense the uh, ocean air coming in. Because the house was built on a tsunami zone, so part of the house have to be uh, elevated so that if a tsunami comes, the water can uh, uh, penetrate under the house. So we use the same uh, vaulting system to elevate the part of the house that are required to. And then uh, have a huge double height space as a living room and then you see the uh, 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 kitchen and um, dining room bit beyond, and then the open courtyard, and then a master bedroom that's situated in between. Um, we we look work with a lot of physical models to get a sense of the space, and and uh, we'll quite try to be quite precise in how these rooms are actually shaped and defined. At the same time, allow for certain accidents to happen when one room encounters another. So. There are moments like this, which for us are happy accidents, when, uh, when one vault, a smaller vault, engages a, a larger vault. And then there are uh, kind of unhappy accidents, like, like this, when two uh, Gothic vaults appear. <laughs> um, uh, on the street side, actually, it, it's quite uh, contextual in terms of working with the Spanish colonial houses next to it. But instead of arches, we actually have vaults. They're always volumetric. So the smaller room actually have a higher ceiling, and the larger room has a, has a lower ceiling. We even use the vault to open up, slice open the edge to increase the width of the entry before you enter into the courtyard. So this kind of uh, compactness is in contrast with the uh, more, poros uh, more porosity on, on the beach side. We also uh, reverse the, the, the vault as an opening. So you don't have this groin vault situation with, with the uh, clear story light. Um, this was taken maybe a month ago. Um, so you see we use the same opening for the courtyard before you enter as well as a series of uh, clear uh, In contrast to the street side, there's no house next to it uh, at the moment, but we know eventually. Oh, sorry. But we know eventually that we'll so we preemptively think about um, where the openings could be. Uh, the path to the courtyard, and then uh, this is the double height space with the master bedroom above that opens to the courtyard as well as to the uh, double height living room. And this is here. You are more than two thirds into the house, but you still feel connected to the courtyard, and then subsequently to the beach. This is, not, this is a sculpture, this is not a person. So just <laughs> for scaling purposes, it's a gigantic sculpture. Uh, uh, I think we like Godard, we love Casa Malaparte, but I think sometimes we, we, we try to distill the, 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 the feeling of the space down to, down to one shot. Maybe it's just about the, the, the vaulting space, the profile in relationship to a distant view. Um, 
part of what we, we, we experimented in the beach house, we are also trying in a, a small vacation house that we're designing right now in, in Matarana between uh, Barcelona and Valencia. Uh, it's a small house that's situated in the middle of a, a almond tree grove. So they're relatively low, the trees. Uh, but it, when, once a year when it blossoms, it has these really beautiful white flowers. So we, want, we design a house that's round, uh, that's slightly elevated. So at, at, at times you'll feel like you're, you're surfing or floating above the sea of, uh, of almond trees. Um, it, it's subdivided, but then uh, our goal is that it could be all open. So you don't need four rooms. So when there's one family or one person, you can open and really see this uh, panoramic view that's very different on all four sides. Uh, similar to the house in Argentina, we employ very similar, similar cuts. So uh, geometrically, it's very, very simple. It's really a, a cylinder with a series of cuts um, that, that uh, have a, a resulted in a small footprint and a larger top and ending up with a, with a jacuzzi in the roof. Um, I think part of it was our interest also in this, the curvature of the volume in contrast with the curvature of the inner walls in relationship to this uh, distant view of the mountains. Um, these are the realtor's uh, renderings. Um, this, is, this is a house that we finished um, ten, almost 10 years ago. It's on, it's on a very steep hillside uh, in Pacific Palisades, not far away from the Eames house and not far away from the ocean. Uh, it's a very s substandard lot. And uh, Los Angeles had this hillside ordinance implemented in the 90s to discourage overbuilding on uh, hillsides such as Hollywood Hills. So uh, when you go to the city, this is what you give. You have a package of requirements of this hillside zone. So when we received that, we thought maybe we can uh, uh, use it not as a policing device, but a design device, uh, conceptually not unlike uh, what Hugh Ferris did uh, to uh, spatialize the zoning requirements uh, of New York City with a setback and have this vision of a crystalline city. So uh, back then we had Form Z, we began to do something, you know, the, to basically spatialize the maximum buildable volume. Uh, but at the same time, we worked with the engineer to, to minimize the footprint because uh, a lot of money in construction for hillsides goes into the foundation, uh, which is uh, often as tall as the building itself. So by having a smaller footprint, it allows us to reduce the amount of caissons uh, that goes into the ground while uh, creating this maximum volume above. Um, we were exci excited about this and did, the, did this whole modeling for the entire uh, uh, block on the hill. Uh, but uh, the planners were not amused at all. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think we, uh, this is really an outside-in project because the constraints were really in the, uh, 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 the, the volumetrics, if this is a feasible project or not. So once we, we worked out the volume, we begin to think about the, the apertures. And we try to maintain the tension between extremely small versus extremely big. So we did the same thing with the openings, where we try to exaggerate the openings, the size of the openings, where it faces the views, and, and minimize the size of the openings that it faces the neighbors, and strategically place so nothing is directly in front. At the same time, also building a cabinetry and volumes around it, so to have a, a tension between uh, openings that have a, a certain depth and poche that, uh, that also relates to the mass of the building versus uh, a glass that are pretty much right up against the aperture. Um, so so two, two different ways of, uh, telescopic way of seeing the view, uh, episodically versus a much more panoramic way. The house is half sunken, so it's, it seems like a much lower house when you enter because we built to the edge of the buildable envelope. So the indoor-outdoor uh, sensation is very different from the mid-century indoor-outdoor uh, 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 spatial qualities where the floor and the roof extends beyond and the glass is almost not there. But 70% of the year, the sliding glass doors could open. So it, it, it quickly turns an interior space into an outdoor gazebo. And, and by having a small footprint with two walls that are in compression in, in uh, uh, perpendicular to the, to, the land, to the slope itself, the floor above is actually hope, holding, holding the, the walls back in tension. Everything below, yeah, this floor. Everything below is built out of concrete. Everything above is built out of steel. Um, but we didn't express the steel uh, 
uh, we have to deal with earthquake codes there. We have very thick steel members, a lot of cross members. So being 100 meters next to the Eames house, we thought if we expose the steel, this will look like a steel house on steroids. Mm -hmm. So the only feeling you get that it's a steel house is the lack of intermediary supports and the spans and the cantilevers. So in a way, the house is re really site-specific. It really fits this particular s the site like a glove. I, uh, I was a student of Pierre Koenig's, um, and um, I think this image, is the, the original image, is so well-known, and it becomes an icon of mid-century living in Southern California. But sometimes we, we, we ask how much did the architecture actually play into this sensation. Like, we remove the roof, we remove the foreground, can we distill the image down to this corner window in relationship to a distant view? And, and, the, and for us, it becomes important, this continu continuation of this profile that separates this foreground to this uh, distant background. And, and in, in, in many ways, the siting of this project, the Hill House, is not unlike a project that we uh, designed in Monte Pucciano, um, that Naki mentioned. It's a small winery. And uh, uh, right now, there are some existing buildings there. You, you, you enter from the top from a road. And uh, this is what we plan. We plan to build a retaining wall and then partially sink the main building, so, uh, as well as an accessory building. So when you approach, uh, you don't really see the building itself, uh, with the goal that in the future, there could be more buildings added around uh, like a necklace. So, so in a way, the, the profile of the retaining wall and the building uh, uh, works together with uh, shaping the, the relationship with the, with the distant uh, uh, landscape, this quite typical Tus uh, Tuscan landscape. Um, uh, so one would descend into the wine tasting area and then walk out into the courtyard. And, and this courtyard for us is, we don't want to repeat the same view or a more inferior view that you saw that's much more panoramic above. So, so like the stairwell in the Argentina house, we try to create this sensation that you are, you are semi-enclosed, but you're also extended out. I mean, I think being in Southern California, the, the, the Salk Institute, I mean, I shouldn't mention it. You always like mention the examples that are better. I think the Salk Institute has, has some of those qualities. And I think we try to capture it in a more domestic scale space where uh, geometrically, it's really one curvature that, that unites the, the two wings as well as unite the two wing walls that are, that are slightly curved. So th there's, a, there's a, a, I think, a geometric uh, economy that we're trying to, to achieve. Um, the, the water that's recycled from the uh, wine production is used as a reflecting pool that, that is level with this one, one point where the curved walls comes, comes to a point. In a way, uh, the curvature works with the landscape, the, 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 more uh, closer landscape than the way that the profile did from a distance. And uh, it's an agricultural building. There's only a certain type of bricks we could use. So we're using this antiquated brick to clad the entire building, the walls, the roof, but with the exception of the interior courtyard being clad in travertine, almost like a piece of the, the hill is being uh, uh, excavated. And. Uh, I think this, this notion of, of space, distant view, and uh, how spatially uh, one could resonate the interior space and relate to this uh, distant view is also um, something we attempted in a project we finished recently. It's a, a single family house situated on a, on a va uh, uh, facing a valley on a, with a slightly curved topography. So we took almost a, a, a typical type of this double porch American house Bend, bend it slightly uh, in, in almost like a receptacle for the landscape uh, in contrast with straight sliding glass doors with a double height living space above that has a, a lining in the interior. So almost like the lining, inner lining of clothes that begin to differentiate, spatially differentiate and break down this larger room as well as for us echo the landscape beyond and reflect light into it. So you actually enter in, in, into the side and then turn and then discover this, uh, this uh, large open space. So here, you walk into the, the open space, you see that the, the soffit above, um, a series of skylights that reflect uh, natural light into the soffit, that balance out the light that's coming into the, from the large open windows, and then also a series of smaller rooms that this ribbon begins to uh, define these type of nested spaces 
in, in contrast to the large open space uh, that uh, the whole house is anchored around. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, subtle curvature with a retaining wall in the house itself, as you can see in the reflection on the, on the sliding glass doors. So uh, if that f the first series of projects that Mark just shared, um, <laughs> smaller scale singular objects capture our interest in um, the notion of um, the kind of scenic aspect of architecture, how we can almost think of architecture as a projector, both of light and view and atmosphere, combined with um, a, a, a relatively wide-ranging um, experimentation of, of form and structure. The next series of projects we're going to show you are, are a little bit bigger. They're getting slowly getting bigger. Uh, and are probably unified by an interest in um, how to use multiple objects to approximate something larger. And we have always been fascinated um, by Baldessari. He's an LA artist. And in particular, I think this piece really captures for us this interest in the idea of a kind of specific form with a, with a generic content. So um, we start with um, the frame made specifically for the snake. And then it is transposed onto other kind of iconic filmic images and takes on a whole um, different kind of intention and um, specificity of content in that, in that transposition. So this, this first project might be familiar to some of you here at the GSC. Maybe some of you guys worked on one of these buildings. This was our contribution to the Ordos 100 project um, in Western China. So Ai Weiwei, um, the, the Chinese artist, cu um, curated and created this master plan. So this is our plot. There are 100 different um, houses in the master plan. And um, this is Weiwei's model from a show we had maybe two years ago now at Bregenz. And for us, we, it's a single family house, but extremely large by Chinese terms. This is 1,000 square meters. So it was a little bit absurd. But in that sense, we thought about it more as a kind of an urban project than, than a house project or a domestic project, given not only its scale, but the adjacency and kind of density in a way of the, of the master plan. So in that way, we first started by thinking, what is the most kind of primitive notion of a house, um, which is this sort of gabled megaron roof? And how can we begin to develop that with a kind of proposition towards the urban? And so for us, that meant to double it. And secondly, we imagined that we wanted to, we, we felt to kind of be able to grab a larger territory and respond in a way to the, in an almost urban way to the context that we rotated the building on the plot. So there's really no front, but it is a continually sort of rotating around and then that sense captures extended views across, um, across the larger landscape and not simply the most immediate parcel. Um, this doubleness is somehow present from all the views of the house, but it's never the same. And in that way, it, it has this sense of, um, for us, a kind of urbanness that it's, it's always changing and it's, it's dynamic in its, in its figure. I have to say that I was, uh, when we showed this project, our Swiss colleagues called this the Playboy facade. <laughs> I don't know why. I think this is evidence that we're not Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think what is um, the only givens for the project were that it, its size and its um, construction method and materials, so they're all cast in place with um, brick cladding. There was a couple different choices of brick. And so I think for, given that large size, what we began to play with, not only in the formal resolution of the house, but also the way the apertures worked, was to, was to in some moments, really express the structure and understand um, the kind of heaviness of the building, and in other cases, push the aperture all the way to the edge. So in some, in some cases, it felt extremely light. And that was also, I think, part of the, the logic of very deep windows, as we've talked about in some of the other projects, and others where you enter, for example, which are immediately um, coplanar with the facade of the house. So the, the landscape of apertures both addresses clim climatic issues as well as um, the sort of intermediate domestic space between the envelope and the in most intimate interior rooms. Here's that Playboy facade again, the, <laughs> the bunny ears. Um, I think, as well, this is a pretty extreme climate. It's a, it's a high desert, so it's very hot and very cold throughout the year. And given the depth of this floor plate, um, this central core sort of it's a light not only brings light into the depth of the house, but also acts like a kind of a solar chimney. So it's a kind of negative space that forms the core of the house, which you can see.
from Ordos. That was the beginning of um, a lot of these group projects originated in a way through collaborations that happened uh, on the Ordos project. Mark very elegantly um, skipped both the trips to China, but I spent about two weeks there um, <laughs> over the course of a really hot summer. And I was at Monte Pociano. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> but the upside is we met a lot of new friends, and that led to this project, which was a master plan, a housing project um, off Lake Geneva in Switzerland. So it wasn't all bad. We, we, we got some new projects from it. So the master plan was um, uh, developed by Chris Gontenbein, a, a relatively young firm in Basel, um, and they invited a group of other architects to work with them on developing this sort of pedestrian free or car free pedestrian um, kind of virgin landscape um, ground and then each one of our um, projects sat upon that and our particular site was this one in the middle which was the biggest parcel and also sat in the most kind of complex section of the site. I mean this is a, a more manageable scale for us. I mean autos is really like a Big architecture orgy, 100 architects, 10,000 square foot per, per, per house. You know, this is closer for us to the, the earlier international bau of Stellung, the Weissenhof, that, that type of scale. And also each one, are, all of them are housing uh, unit buildings. So in our case, um, we had sort of the biggest footprint. It was in, in the kind of middle of the site and it was also in a kind of steep section. And so our goal was first to maximize the buildable footprint that we could because we knew the view is, is really fantastic both to the lake and to the mountains behind. So really fitting in all of the units to maximize that envelope and then carve out uh, a series of um, kind of tangential rotated courtyards that both allow for the public to the other vis um, residents of the property to pass through it because it's above one of the main parking lots but also so that the kind of, it's both public but, but private um, in the way that it's, um, we, 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 we work with um, the facades. So in this, this diagram, you, just, you get a sense of the kind of total panorama of the perimeter and then the very kind of discrete and frame views that are offered by the way the, the pinch courtyards link together. Um, so that in this, the sense that we're passing through about, there's about a three and a half meter differential from this side to this side. There's a series of steps that move through um, each one of the courtyards. And um, what was important for us is that this, this kind of sense of diagonality, that you were never, there was never a kind of pure axial movement through, but it was a series of kind of episodic spaces that linked in kind of a precarious way. So the, I, in contrast to the perimeter of the building, which was almost completely glazed, um, these, the courtyards were quite, in a sense, private, but, but, but more abstract in the way that the fenestration works. So there was entry points for the, the residents, and then only select apertures in the moments where the public spaces uh, stretch from the courtyard to the perimeter of the building. It's, it's really an inside-out house. You enter from the garage below into these courtyard first before you enter into your unit. And then um, here you can get a sense of just how that section works. So that by working through the kind of organizing the units and the perimeter of the building, we're able to maintain a kind of uniform condition around the entire perimeter of the building. So this is a, a project that we just finished. Mark just came back from Shanghai. It was part of the West, Shanghai West Bund Biennale that um, opened in last month. And so um, 12 architects were invited um, each to do a pavilion. And for better or worse, ours was one of the first ones built, um, probably construction time of about six weeks. Um, <laughs> so it shows. But anyway, we'll show it to you. Um, and the, the program for the, for the building is um, an exhibition gallery. So um, it, it has kind of will evolve over time. But for right now, it was exhibiting all of the other pavilions that didn't get built yet. And um, it, in a way, as an extension of the, the work we were doing in Chile, the, the Penko um, building. But it's now we have six volumes um, that are approximating a larger form, but sort of nest in a, in a, in a kind of systematic way around a central um, triangular courtyard. And so three of the volumes are oriented outwards, um, which will eventually have more public programs like cafe or, or, or restaurant or bookstores, things like that. And then these, these inwardly oriented volumes will be for exhibition. And then as, to, as they come together, they kind of can work all as, as one continuous space. 
so that the, the outwardly um, oriented volumes capture um, views of the surrounding river. Chipperfield has um, just got approved for a museum, which will be right across the street from, from this building. Uh, then, so that has a kind of intensity of light and atmosphere and the, those exteriorly oriented volumes, whereas the interior courtyard is a much softer atmospheric light for exhibition space. And then air circulates through those two differing um, blazing systems. I think what's interesting for us about this project is that it's both, um, it sometimes feels like a number of small buildings aggregated together, and in other moments, it starts to feel like one, one larger building. And it's that kind of ambiguity about approximating something large with a series of small pieces that um, has interested us in these larger scale buildings. The ladders were there literally half an hour before the opening. <laughs> um, so I think the, the, the kind of atmospheric quality of the way the apertures works is, is maybe captured here, where the, the kind of directness of the view is, is then kind of, of, let's say, an entry in contrast to the kind of softness um, of the interior courtyard. Or, and then a kind of third um, aperture is the, are the skylights, which start to create yet another kind of figure in the, um, in the space as they, as they cast light on the curving um, plane of the back wall. Uh, so this is um, a, a larger project. It's, it's for the same client that we are doing the winery for. It's in a town called Grattaferrata, which is um, about 20 minutes from, from Rome. And so it's, um, this is the main kind of Corsa del Popolo, which the site just touches um, just on this end. So it's a large park and then a series of historic buildings that have, um, were occupied or, or, or in some cases never finished over a long history. And it's kind of an interesting historic town. This is a, um, kind of a monastery where the Da Vinci Codex was restored. So it's a paper restoration um, site. And so it's, it's a quite an important um, kind of proximity to that building. It's also the town that uh, Cy Twombly first moved to when he moved to Italy before he settled in Rome. The town of Grotta Ferrata, he did a series of paintings uh, named after Grotta Ferrata. So this, this diagram gives you just a sense of the different kind of lineage of buildings. This is a 19th century villa. This is a, um, a kind of earlier 19th century carriage house. It's, it's so, um, so abandoned that there's now incredible trees growing out of the center of it, and then a couple of sort of never finished um, early 20th or kind of mid 20th century um, commercial buildings. And so basically, the project was somehow, in a way, to sort of find the prog programmatically its um, housing um, gallery space for the, the foundation's collection, um, artists and residence studios, and um, kind of creative office flexible space. And, and then in addition to that, a kind of arts park that the client is deeding back to the city. So this will be, be a space with um, outdoor, art, outdoor sculpture and, and um, commercial activities. And given the diversity of those program elements, we, we, we needed to find a, a very kind of elemental strategy for um, creating the buildings that would, that would allow them to be kind of perceived as a, as in, in a kind of unity as a collection, but also respond in a, in a kind of site-specific way to the diversity of conditions that existed there. So our kind of primitive strategy was to take um, a kind of simple, most basic integer of space, this volume, and then look at different ways that we could aggregate them by hinging them together, stacking them, or rotating them. Uh, so this is just an overview of how the buildings are arranged. This is the museum, the housing, the creative office building, and then these are some of the sort of smaller scale pavilions for cafes and things like that. So first, this is the museum building, and uh, it's, it's immediately adjacent to the carriage house. This really has the feeling um, right along the street, as like a medieval street, it's very tight scale. Um, cobblestones and so somehow we understood that as a street and we wanted to create a building that could both be um, a series of studios where artists could um, do work or exhibit individual projects but also could be understood as a kind of collective um, overall sort of gallery museum scale and, and those are all wrapped around a courtyard and what unifies them then is the way we um, operate on the roof. So it, with one singular curve cut, the, the building um, can be understood as one singular volume. 
So here we've we've transposed it into um, MoMA's courtyard, um, replacing Breuer's um, temporary uh, inhabitation of the courtyard. Um, but for us, the, I think the importance of the silhouette of the roof um, is what is what helps you understand it as as a, as, a, as a singular building. This the creative office building has a very different kind of contextual circumstance, which is it's surrounded by these large, big, almost stone-like buildings, which are very different in their texture and grain and their scale. And then finally, there's a kind of existing residential neighborhood behind it. And so in this case, we, we, we thought, about the, as a, thought about the building as a building in the round. So really thinking about a strategy for creating the form and structure of the building that could respond in a specific way um, and become a kind of active agent in relationship to those, those buildings which surround it. <laughs> um, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, the housing, the housing, and this was probably one of the really tricky parts of the project because um, in the kind of complexity of this public-private partnership with the city, we wanted to maintain as much of the ground space for the public and for public art. And the idea then was to take this logic and, and in this case, stack one on top of each other. So it's almost like a series of mini towers. And then the next move was to think about how we could not occupy this ground in maybe the traditional way that a villa might with a kind of front garden where people are having tea and hanging their laundry, but somehow invert that. So the way that you, you enter these buildings is actually from a roof, from the roof um, series of uh, elevator cores. You enter into a rooftop terrace, which affords a great view of back to Rome, and then you descend down into um, the units. And it's a kind of complex web of intertwined um, different kinds of apartments, um, also with artist studios nested in between. Um, so this is uh, another, um, it's a house project, it's in Kauai, um, which happens to be in the North Shore of Kauai, the wet, one of the wettest places in the world. And so this is essentially, basically, it's a, it's a big roof project. It's about, the, the roof of this project um, encompasses about 7,000 square feet, and underneath are basically four houses. So it's, a, it's, it's four houses under one roof. And this, this diagram um, illustrates the enclosed space and the exterior covered space. So it's about 50-50 of interior room and covered porch. All of that is organized around a courtyard. Um, it's a really, not only is it an extremely wet place, it's, it's an extremely windy place, and so it's a really dynamic weather environment. And the house needs to both fortify against that, but also harness those, um, the light, the heat, the, and the rain. Um, in an intelligent way. And so the roof, in this sense, almost becomes like a fifth facade. It's, it's a way, given the depth of the footprint um, of the roof, it is um, punctured by apertures that bring light into the deep portions of each one of the houses underneath the roof, or all oriented around the courtyard. So this is the courtyard space, and these are the, the apertures um, that penetrate all the way through the depth of the roof um, into the, in each one of the primary volumes of the house. One, the only real mandate in terms of a kind of design guideline was this idea of the hip roof. And so what we, um, our approach to it was to essentially um, expand it so it covered the entire footprint of the house and then start to warp it in the way that the courtyard um, aperture carved into it. So it never has a kind of, each profile, um, each orientation of the house, it has a very different um, sense of, uh, the, the form of the roof is, is very different. So th this project is just about finished, um, but it gives you a sense of the, the courtyard, um, the kind of warped aperture of that uh, opening in, in relation to these skylights. Um, this, this image, um, of course, you probably all recognize this, is a kind of transformation of the Barcelona Pavilion, but it is, is depicting the, the, the hut house, as we call this project. And I think it somehow um, distills for us that kind of essence of that project, which is, which is about this kind of near proximity, this blurred line between interior space 
um, and the surrounding courtyard, the idea of the, the roof um, as, a, as a kind of window um, to the sky, as a thing that modulates light, and, the, and the, this kind of near, kind of prox and just simply the way two walls come together to define a space. It's sort of that minimum amount of definition to d define an, an, a volume of space. And um, this interest in collage, and um, we've shown you a couple of um, images of collages of Mies before. Um, this is um, uh, entitled um, A Concert, Concert yeah. Hall. And so it's, um, we were, I've always been fascinated by these images that use the, the most minimal, in a way, abstract means to define a, um, a way to inhabit space. And so we, we decided we'd find out where this was actually, the image, that where this factory was. And so it was, it's actually an image of an Albert Kahn factory. And so our, our what we were decided to kind of take a look at what was actually masked out or edited out um, in the Mies collage. And for us, it became a really fascinating um, study of the importance of the roof plane, the, the notion of the aperture, and um, the extension of the ground as, as, as a way to define um, um, a definition of, of a larger scale project. So this last series of, there's two projects, our, our, some, our most current projects and um, probably our, our, our largest projects. And I think for us, um, this is also a Mies collage. Um, the, the, um, Convention, con yeah. Con the convention hall. And so here, in this case, the, the roof c seems to extend to infinity and offers um, a kind of total flexibility of, of occupying that space underneath the roof. I think the, the first 10, 12 years of our office existence, most of the projects are small scale. Um, we're dealing with very singular objects, you know. So the last few years, as we are engaging a scale change, you know, not only are we thinking about multiple forms, but uh, larger organizational elements. but So in some of the opportunities that we have, the roof becomes something else. So I think for us, also the Mies Collage help us think about how the roof would change the notion of aperture that we have dealt with before, or the roof itself beyond the membrane could it also be a punctured membrane. So this is um, our project for the um, new studio arts building for the graduate studio uh, for UCLA. It's in Culver City in what an area called the Hayden Track. So it's an industrial area that's slowly transforming into a much more kind of conventional creative office um, kind of development. And so the, the, the studio program has been here since the mid 80s and it's been a sort of agglomeration. There's this kind of beautiful old wallpaper factory building which is surrounded by these sort of appendages that the program has added and a number of sort of nondescript factory buildings. It's about a 55,000 square foot footprint of, um, of building. And so our first approach or, or, or problem to solve was to really excavate and find the kind of DNA of, of the site and then begin to amplify that and allow and develop a kind of development strategy for the, the building. So he, this is the existing condition. This is the proposed uh, demolition of all the sort of superfluous structures um, and infrastructure. So we're left with um, a plinth. This is a raised plinth. It's a factory building. So kind of supply and of materials demanded a three foot high base. And so we propose to extend that base to kind of create a continuous ground. And then also a continuous uh, envelope for the precinct of the building. And then finally, if this is the existing warehouse with the Botrus building, we propose to extend that logic of the bow trust to cover the entire site. So this is um, a model, just kind of a diagram that gives you a sense of um, the scale of the warehouse. And then um, this is without the roof, the roof covering, but the, this kind of wrapper that, that both encloses laboratories, all the public, public um, dimensions of the program. So the student labs, galleries, classrooms, artisan residence, um, garden, all of those things sur surround um, the studios, which is the kind of inner sanctum of the program, and gives a much more kind of porous public um, uh, boundary to the project. Uh, we, we didn't mention that this around our site is in the center of where Eric Owen Moss built a lot of his uh, uh, quite exuberant and sculptural buildings. So, uh, working with the studio of School of Fine Arts and the faculty, we decidedly want to make the exterior of the building very undesigned. You know, so we we duplicated the facade of the existing building around, and and in a way, uh, the 
looking at the vernacular of the bowstring trust building, where it's really a vault, but at the end, oftentimes when it ends, it becomes a line. So it has this uh, a ruled surface at the end. And what we're trying to do is try to take that exception in, as, as the rule itself, that, that, this, that this flat line doesn't always happen at the edge, but also happens in the middle of these open spaces. And, and the roof would be uh, polycarbonate, so it covers certain areas that are, that are not conditioned, outdoor areas like sculpture courtyards and such. So I think we're interested in the way, uh, as Mark said, this sort of elemental, almost banal, but, but trying to extend, let's say, the, the truss becomes a, a, a frame that then um, extends past the building volume but captures um, this as a beam and just simply defines, that's the entry um, for the students into the school on, this, on the back end from the parking. So these are the four facades. Uh, I think the, the idea, as, as Mark mentioned, that this kind of almost um, factory-like um, undefinition was, was important to us, but then the way that the, the, the apertures, the voids work within the, the new landscape of enclosed um, laboratories, covered workshop areas that are covered but unconditioned, and even then, um, the, the kind of transparency of that roof suggests, in a way, it's almost, we, we conceive of the project almost like a city within the city, that it has a kind of complexity and, and porosity that um, offers a, a kind of flexibility and undeterminacy that seemed appropriate for us, um, given that it's a, a studio art building. So in a way, if we understand the project as a, like, a, like a mini city, there's a number of kind of important urban pieces that um, stitch the, and unify the project, starting with what we call an arcade, which is kind of connects the main street to the parking, which is here. So it's a covered, um, it's a covered but unconditioned space. So it's both circulation, but it's a place for work, for display, for crits. Um, the, the plaza, the kind of center bay space, which is here, which is nested within the, the kind of neighborhood of studios, and it's a vital place where a lot of the um, interior, like painting and sculpture um, workshops happen. And then the outdoor covered sculpture yard, which unifies the ceramics lab and the sculpture um, lab, and um, then the garden. Uh, it was a space that the students, this idea that the students could make that place, they could transform it, they could harvest that. The garden was a critical part of how they understood um, the urban quality of the building. I think what was interesting for us as well was, was almost beginning to think about the, the structural system of the roof almost as a landscape in itself. So you could begin to move through it, the stairs threaded through it, it circulation um, uh, um, walks were hung from it, so it, it really became a kind of total landscape. I think this idea of twilight, that the, it's not really, it doesn't really have strong shadows in the space is also something that we're trying to to capture. <laughs> this, this, I think, just uh, shows our aspiration. We hope this building is so banal that Ed Roche would paint it one day. <laughs> um, because we started our talk with uh, some artwork, we like to end with some art, too. This is uh, three pieces by John Baldessari, done in the 70s. Uh, the title of this piece is Using Your Finger to Achieve a Straight Line. And, and then I think for us, it's about uh, creating an ideal, in this case, a straight line. And it's about using what you have uh, at your disposal to achieve that. But, but rather than seeing the discrepancy between the ideal and what you can achieve as a, as a negative, we can turn that into a quality in itself. Um, there's the second piece by uh, uh, Baldessari is, is titled, uh, Throwing Three Balls into the Air to Achieve an Equilateral Triangle, the Best of 36 Tries. So I, I think the, uh, uh, the tension between the ideal and, and whether it's chance or what you have at hand is also at play, but, but also the, 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 the process, that the 36 tries is also uh, inscribed in the work itself. And, and then the last piece is, is titled uh, 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 Using Cigar Smoke to Match uh, Different Clouds. Um, uh, it's, it's an absurd proposition, but I think sometimes as architects we feel that uh, what is asked uh, uh, from us is very clear uh, to match the clouds. Uh, 
and, and the tools that are given to us are also very clear. In this case, uh, uh, a cigar and a match. And, and I think uh, as a, a, a metaphor, I think oftentimes we find ourselves uh, using, the, uh, using the match to dissect the cigar and then using the match to painstakingly organize the tobacco leaves to simulate the clouds. And because of the labor we went through, we congratulate ourselves and be blinded. I, I think this piece uh, helped remind us not to forget the most fundamental and natural way is, is really to uh, light the cigar and, and, and smoke and, and, and enjoy the tobacco and, uh, uh, and, 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 and create some smoke. And, and once in a while, if you're lucky, you get to make some clouds too. Uh, that's the end of our talk. Thank you very much. Do we uh, take some questions, uh, if there yeah. are any? This is the moment of the questions. Of the out. Thank you. <laughs> That's, a, That's our students, so we planned with that question. <laughs> Thank you for, very much for the lecture, guys. Um, I feel like you've given us lots of clues to this question, but um, I'm wondering, do you, do you sometimes seek banality in the work? And when you do, why? I feel like banality is something that's you know rigorously avoided by many practices, but then the way that you do it, um, sometimes you're critiquing typology, but it's not just that. There's something else at play, and I'm wondering if you could talk, speak to that. I, I, think, I don't think we seek banality, but we are not afraid of banality. I think banality for us is a means to something else. Uh, I, I also think like, I mean, when I look at the artists like uh, Fishley Vice, you know, I, I always think they use a lot of humor. But humor is not the end of the work. Humor is a doorway. You know, and, and I also think banality for us is a doorway, whether to cloak the work as a prelude for something ecstatic beyond or something as a tool of assimilation. I also think sometimes, I mean, maybe in the project like the UCLA project, which is you know pretty early in its design stages, but in that case, there's a kind of indeterminacy that was important to us, a sort of lack of de definition that was part of our sensibility of both the project urbanistically and also programmatically. That it's a it's a studio art building. It's it's going to go through many transformations and over designing it would be ridiculous in a way because it it just would be inappropriate. And so I think. I mean, the architectural context of the UCLA project, the Eric Owen Moss uh, buildings, they're right around. You, you can't go into a beauty contest <laughs> with them. You know, you, you have to be something else. I mean. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the two of you have ever maybe speculated personally on what would happen if you were asked to shift to an even larger scale, like say that of a tower and where you couldn't maybe turn to these um, concerns with specific form and light and views, and you have to confront these really generic mm -hmm. constraints. I mean, um, I, I don't know. I don't know because, um, I mean, I think a lot also has to do with circumstances that were open to us, you know, sometimes uh, when we are getting close to those circumstances, we can anticipate, but uh, I don't think we tend to think too far ahead. You know, I, I, I think we are very uh, conscious of what happens around us and also what happens before us. So, uh, I mean, we're not innocent about Mario Bota. So for us, we see the problem that he had to deal with when he had to jump scale. And so, uh, in our opinion, you know, certain things work very well in a certain scale, but mm -hmm. at a critical threshold, you can't just blow it up. You know, it becomes a different animal. And uh, so we're, we're conscious of that. And we're, as we are approaching to work on medium scale projects, uh, this is something that we are uh, uh, quite conscious of working out right now. The next scale, I don't know. Big roofs now, big towers next. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, I don't see that. I, mean, <laughs> I, I just want to add, and uh, yeah. there's someone else. Yeah, but yeah. Let me say something. I think that all your, your, your work is, is, I mean, one of the most recurring words you have used is city, uh, paradoxically, mm -hmm. in principle. No? So, so 
in orders, you know, when you move mm-hmm. to the, I mean, mm-hmm. all, uh, whatever the scale of the, of the thing is, mm-hmm. there is a kind of, of attention, there is a kind of internal yeah. geometrical mm-hmm. thing that, that is creating attention and, and a, a very, very crafted relationship with a kind of, this kind of ambivalence around the landscape and the city. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it's always this tension. I think that th- this is a principle that can give way to many scales. I don't think that it's a question of scales. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and, uh, sorry. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about the way you uh, translate the uh, immaterial imagination to materials and the reason that uh, most of the projects have uh, like uniform materiality? <laughs> can I respond? <laughs> <laughs> um, It goes back to the LA school. No. <laughs> no I think uh, you. Uh, I think we are. It's inevitable. We tend to react to certain circumstances when we found ourselves in LA. Who our colleagues are. What are others doing? Um, it also has to do with um, the uh, opportunities that were offered to us. The very early projects that we did had very <coughs> little budget. So, I mean, we look at. An architect like uh, like Caesar and has a lot of blank surfaces and very particular openings. It's masterfully done, and maybe the next generation you can say Sutu de Mora is more about frames, and, and you can say well it's because uh, discipline-wise I want to distinguish from that. But I also think Caesar worked on projects with low-income housing, you know. So you have very very tight budget. How do you distribute that budget? I think at the outset. We begin to uh, economize our design energy and just say, well, let certain things be banal, be blank, but how can we do something that are not uh, that are special, but begin to ingratiate the larger mass? So, so uh, at the outset, I think we were we're always focusing on on apertures that, in relationship to the larger mass itself, the uh, uh, the the Hill House, for example, because it was conceived so three dimensionally, we didn't want to, and and the volume was the important thing to solve before the building becomes feasible. We didn't want to have one material for the roof and another material for the wall, and bring it back down to a, a planometric relation. So, uh, at the outset, we know we wanted to shrink wrap the entire building with one material. Uh, at first, we looked at tiles, we looked at other roofing materials, and they eventually found this grail coat that is used for industrial roofs, slightly elastic, but waterproofing, and they, uh, uh, waterproofs the en- en- entire uh, volume. Uh, now, and when we're working in Italy, when we are actually are dealing with material, when we're dealing with antiquated brick, when we're working on Menil, uh, uh, In the Manil project, we, 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 have to, we have to respond to the houses. We have to respond to the context. You know, we looked at brickwork, we looked at woodwork, but, but that also for us becomes a backdrop for the abstractness or maybe the lack of materiality of the roof. You know, I think because of the lack of materiality of the roof, the thinness, the physical weight or lack of weight works together with the more materially uh, defined volumes below. Um, No, I just I would I would add to that that maybe in the Hill House example, I, mean, I think we're very consciously interested in. We know how much work is going on structurally within the envelope of the house, but we find that that con- the, to contrast that work by disguising it with a monolithic membrane gives it in a way more complexity because you look at it and it modulates with light and shadow, but it just seems like kind of impossible that it would be that monolithic because we know how much effort goes into it structurally. I think it's, it's, in that case, it's really using it as a kind of, not a dialectic, but as a kind of contrasting quality that gives it, I mean, I think we think it gives it a kind of aura of, of like, how is that, how could that, you know, how could that be monolithic when it's, it's, it's um, each plane is doing such different work. I also think we're oftentimes attracted to buildings that are slightly autistic or reticent. You know, not that they're not warm or welcoming, but it, it demands a certain uh, attention or attention span for it to tell you more. So I, I think this type of uh, reticence is, is not, not, not nothing heavy, not like silence or anything, mm-hmm. but it's just a slight reticence. 
uh, that if that that are very very welcoming. If you're interested in probing more, maybe this is something that led us to this more uh, up to now more monolithic way of dealing with materiality and volume. Um, uh, my question is about the environment. I mean, I'm really fascinated by by, the, by your project and the way you, you're giving a beautiful response to the environment. But I noticed that most of your projects, uh, I mean, the, the environment, the, the the neighborhood is perfect, it's excellent. It's always like either along the, the beach or in the forest, but I wonder, like, what will happen if you are you are situated in a very unfriendly environment? What, what if yeah. you don't have a chance to build a house in <laughs> yeah. the, uh, along yes. the beach or yes. first of all? Uh, what if, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, like, like how to find uh, uh, an interesting uh, an interesting thread or uh, to initiate a thread or, or a concept within a. Mm -hmm. uh, boring or even a hostile environment? Mm -hmm. That's the question. I mean, uh, uh, Inaki just mentioned like Ordos is a hostile environment because we have Preston Scott on one side and Toshiko on the other. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. And, uh, There's nothing about it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like Very close, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, when we even work in these more Virgilian landscapes, such as Argentina on the edge, I, I think, or at least we, we think that might be an urban dimension to it, when we close, it, when we have certain things that are introverted. For, for us, the Shanghai Pavilion is actually conceived of as a house first, you know, a house with three garages. And then the house, the, the, the three volumes, they are, in, they are introverted, it actually opens to the sky. You know, we, we, uh, we secretly wanted to do houses for uh, Raina Banham's four ecologies. You know, the, we've done the beach ecology, we've done the hill ecology, we've done the plains of it. We always want to do a utopia. So the, the initial diagram of that Shanghai Pavilion was actually planned as three garages, like houses, a uh, house for six cars, not six views. <laughs> and, and those were garages and then uh, being in a situation that's much more urban. So it's very selective in terms of where you look out and then where you have uh, privacy. The last, oh. the last question. Okay. <laughs> um, as this lecture is part of the alumni series, I um, may you share with us like how do you first started your practice? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Are we? Uh, we, after we graduated, we work, uh, we taught, and uh, we moved back to LA uh, and we taught, and then there were uh, an opportunity uh, for a series of small projects, and we just thought, we didn't plan, we just said, let's, let's try to do this with no expectations, and maybe we finish it, maybe we don't, maybe nothing happens, who knows, you know? I mean, it started off very organically that way, and it was uh, because of our interest with uh, uh, modern and contemporary art, our first projects was uh, uh, a small renovations and additions to single family houses in Marfa, Texas, the town uh, known for uh, Donald Judd's complex that was planned there. And after he passed away, the other foundations that began to take advantage of the artists in residence uh, community there. So we started doing a project for a foundation to design houses for writers and poets in residence. And I think that basically snowballed into uh, uh, a lot of projects that are art related, whether it be uh, artist collaborations to uh, projects for collectors to projects for institutions and such. So um, not that that's, it's the only singular track, but somehow uh, that happened and then, and then one thing led to another. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.